Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we welcome you to the Lord's house today. May God richly bless us as we hear his word and as we uh, sing his praises, as we turn to him in our need, knowing that he will answer us according to his will, which is always the best for us. So we're glad to have you with us. We welcome our guests and visitors who are here today and a reminder for everyone to sign the record of fellowship and pass that to your neighbor. A happy Independence Day. Today is the 4th of July, and we are thankful that we live in this country, and we pray that God would continue to bless our nation, that we would be able to enjoy the freedoms he's granted us and continue to use our country for good uh, among our people and also around the world, and we'll include our nation in our prayers this morning. So we turn to our opening hymn, God Has Spoken by His Prophets, number 583. We'll stand as we sing the last stanza. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, 
and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has for this is my resting place forever. Here I will I will abundantly bless her provisions. Her priest I will clothe with salvation. And her saints will shout for joy. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. He is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and Oh, 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for today, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, is from the second chapter of the book of Ezekiel. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, it's upon this reading that the sermon will be based this morning. Paul says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from be being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In honor of Jesus, we stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. 
And he could not do mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about, go, about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take your seats. We invite the children to come up to the front for a children's message. me and we've got a couple that are still coming to join us so they can pray with us as they come up we say dear God please be with us as we learn about you amen how many of you have gone on a trip is anybody here getting ready to go on a trip Ooh, a few of us are. I'm getting ready to go on a trip, too, which is why I brought my suitcase with me. I wonder if you guys can help me. Next Sunday, right after the early service, our high school youth and I are going to head up to Flathead Lake to a camp to spend a week working with the camp and working on things. And I put together a packing list, and I just want to see if you guys have the same kinds of things on your packing list when you go on a trip, what kinds of things do you bring on a trip? Clothes. Clothes is probably an important thing. Toys. Do you bring some toys to play in the car and play with when you get where you're going? Shoes. Ooh, we got to have shoes. What other kinds of things? Blankets, maybe, or if you're going camping, you might bring sleeping bags. Some what? Oh, socks, yeah. I guess we could have counted that with clothes. We bring socks with us. A swimsuit, maybe when you get there, there's going to be a place to swim. Hmm. Anything else you bring? We talked about clothes and shoes and socks and swimsuits and blankets and toys. Ooh, Landon says the Bible. That would be a good thing to bring. What about anything else to read? Do you bring any other books? Does anybody bring, let's see, I know the answer to this question for a couple people. A joke book to tell jokes in the car? That could be good. What about a Kindle? Or a Game Boy or some other games to play in the car, some other things to do. What about a toothbrush and toothpaste? 
Unless your mom forgets to put the toothbrush in your bag when you head to camp, right, Landon? What about shampoo and soap and other things to help take care of our bodies? Hmm, I think you guys have a pretty good list. You guys have a pretty good list. Aaliyah, you thought of one more? A phone. You might need your phone. You might need a map. Do you think you would need a map if you're going on a trip? A way to know where you're going? Well, let's see if I have everything that I need for my trip. Am I ready for my trip? No, why am I not ready? There's nothing in my bag. When we go on a trip, we think about all of the things that we might need. We bring extra clothes, we bring socks, we bring toothbrushes and toothpaste and shampoo and soap and all the things that we need. But did you hear what Pastor just said about Jesus when he sent his disciples out on a trip? Listen to this. And he, Jesus, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Jesus said, don't take anything except for a stick to help you along the way as you walk, the sandals that you're wearing on your feet, and the clothes that you're wearing on your back. Don't even put on an extra tunic. Do you know why Jesus did that? When Jesus was sending them out, he was charging them to take one thing with them. It sounds like Jesus sent them with nothing. He actually sent them with the most important thing. He sent them with his word. He sent them with his authority. He sent them with himself. Jesus gave them authority to go out and heal people, to spread the good news about him. And Jesus gives us that same power through his word. No matter where we go, and if we go on a trip and we forget our toothbrush or we forget other things on our trip, sometimes that can be frustrating. But no matter where we go, we always have God's word whether it's in a Bible that we can hold in our hands or the word that he's put on our heart, we always have his word to share with others. So as you guys get ready to go on trips this summer, I want you to think about that. You can share God's word with each other because sometimes I know long car rides can get kind of hard with our families. We can share God's word with each other. We can share God's word with those that we're visiting. We can share God's word wherever we go. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the reminder today that when you send us out, you send us with you. You send us with your word and with the authority that you've given to us through what you've done for us on the cross. Help us to share that with everyone around us this summer as we come and go from Billings and help us to spread that good news wherever we are. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you guys can head back to your seats, and the congregation is going to sing our next hymn.
Grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, as I heard the children's message this morning from Mr. Heiliger, I couldn't help but think about the first longest trip I had ever taken. In 1999, I went to Ukraine to teach at a seminary outside of Odessa for about six weeks, and, uh, and I forgot to pack socks. I just had the socks I was wearing. You try to find size 15 in Ukraine, it's pretty hard. So, and the other thing that was more serious, I forgot, I, I had my U.S. passport, but I forgot my Canadian landed immigrant papers, and so to get back into the country. So it's a long story. I made it back, but it was uh, kind of a tense time, but a, a, a meaningful time. I was thinking about something that happened there in Ukraine, though. I had a, I was in an apartment with my translator, Slavic, and, and about halfway through that trip, he said something to me that, that, it, that was really interesting. He said, he said, Pastor, you are different than I expected you to be. Because he talked with an accent, you know. And he said, he says, I've never met an American before until I met you, but you're not arrogant like I heard all Americans are. And I thought that was interesting, that we get a bad rap. And sometimes we can be arrogant. I think arrogance is not something that's by nation, but by individual. And, uh, but I just remember that he said that, that I'm, I'm not what I, what I expected you to be. And, uh, and yet all of us can have some pride. All of us can have some arrogance. As we celebrate Independence Day and we're thankful to God for the independence that we have as a nation and the freedoms that we have, sometimes we are too independent as individuals. And we see that in the reading today, that sometimes we get big-headed, sometimes we are conceited, sometimes we think we can do it on our own, and yet we discover that we are completely dependent upon the Lord. And so as we, uh, let's turn to the Lord's Word now and consider this word before us from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to start with verse 7 to begin my message. And there's a a word that's, that is different in, in the bulletin, I'm going to point that out in a moment, well, right now. So he says, so to keep me from becoming not too elated, but I'm going to use the word conceited, that's what the word is also. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Well, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, who has abundant grace for all, have you ever experienced this? Have you ever prayed to the Lord because you had a problem and a concern, and he answered your prayer with yes? You had surgery, and you prayed that Lord, the Lord would get you through surgery safely, and he did. You were flying over the ocean, and you prayed that God would get you safely to the other side many hours later, and he said yes to your prayer, and you made it there safely. You prayed to the Lord because you had a huge conflict and a problem with someone, and you just didn't know how it was going to work. It didn't look good, and you asked the Lord to help, and he said yes, and he made that meeting and that conflict go much better than you ever would have imagined. So have you ever prayed to the Lord and he said, yes, of course, we've experienced that, haven't we? How about when we prayed to the Lord because we had a concern or a problem and God said, no. You prayed that you could get into a certain school and God said, no. You prayed about that new job opportunity that you were excited about. You thought for sure this would be the best thing ever and God said, no. You prayed about a relationship that you thought would make your life just perfect, and God said, uh-uh. You prayed about restoration of health for yourself or someone else and a restoring of mobility, and God said, no. 
When God says no, it can be very difficult. It can be very painful. It can be very hard. In fact, it can be so difficult that we human beings can be tempted to just walk away from God when he says no. I've heard and I've known people who've done that. They put it this way. They say, what, what is the use of believing in God, who, a God who doesn't care? Or they've said, God obviously doesn't love me because he, my prayers don't matter to him. It doesn't matter. Or God doesn't exist because prayer is just a waste of time. Now in our text today, St. Paul did not get his prayer answered with a yes. When he prayed that God would remove that thorn in the flesh, he prayed three times, we're told, and God said no. But then God added something to his no that we need to always remember when we pray to God and we receive a no. Here's what Paul got from God. In fact, God didn't say no, literally, but the answer was no, right? But then he said this, and this is what we need to remember. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Grace, what is that? We should know what that means. We hear about it all the time. How would you describe grace? What would you say? Maybe you would say it something like, some people go to this right away. They look at the word grace, and then they take the first letter of the letter of each, um, each letter in the word grace, and then they make a word. So they would say, God's riches at Christ's expense. Raise your hand if you think of it that way sometimes. It's fairly common. It's helpful. So God's riches at Christ's expense is sufficient for you, was God's answer to Paul. And how could you argue with that? Grace, it means undeserved favor. We are the recipients of God's undeserved favor. We don't deserve the gifts he gives us. We don't deserve his love and mercy and forgiveness. But we have it. He gives what we don't deserve. He gives us forgiveness of our sins and the promise in the, of eternal life, and it's a sure thing because of God's grace. And Paul, when he heard that and when he spoke about that, he may have thought about his own calling, his calling to be an apostle, he was the persecutor of the church. He was going around arresting Christians, being responsible for their imprisonment and for their deaths even, the deaths of men, women, and children. He was on the way to Damascus, as we know, to continue in his persecution against the church. And Jesus stopped him. Now, Jesus could have wiped him off the face of the map with just a snap of his finger, but instead he had grace for Paul, mercy and grace. And he Turn Paul from the great persecutor to the great missionary for Christ and in the church. And this great missionary spoke those words that are so wonderful and familiar to us about grace in Ephesians chapter 2 where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So the Lord told Paul, I'm not going to take the thorn out of your flesh my grace is sufficient for you. Now, it's interesting that verse 9 in Ephesians 2 says this, that this salvation is not a result of works. It's grace, so that no one may boast. But we notice that Paul does some boasting here. The very first verse of our text, Paul speaks about I must go on boasting. So what does he mean by that? He goes on boasting. He'd been boasting already. Let's understand that. In chapter 11, he was talking about a situation in the church. There were these apostles, or these those who claimed to be apostles, and they were in competition with the other apostles. Paul sarcastically, sarcastically calls them super apostles, and they were arrogant. They were boastful in their spirituality. They came in, and they were, as Paul says in chapter 11, they were presenting a different Jesus and a different another gospel which is impossible right and we don't know all the details about them but they would be saying something like we hear today among those who preach a prosperity gospel that if you're a christian then you shouldn't have problems if you're a christian then your life should continue to get better and better and better that would be god's reward for you because you are faithful and and they would turn it upside down and they would emphasize the importance of doing things to get god's favor and that's just not how it works and Paul was challenging them. 
in warning the Corinthians not to follow after those false teachers. Let me read for you some excerpts from chapter 11. Since many boast according to the flesh, and they were boasting, I too will boast. So I'm going to just jump in there now, he says. And listen to what he says. But whatever else anyone dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. He was bold. I am talking like a madman, he says, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments. Notice what he's talking about, difficulties. Countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received the, at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one, 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. His life was not easy, but he's boasting of all those things he went through for the sake of Christ. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. He, er he yearned for the churches. He was concerned about them. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Arturus was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Check that one out in the book of Acts. And then we have our text. I must go on boasting. And he says, though, there is nothing to be gained by it. It's not the point, but he's making the point of God's work. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. So he's shifting now from the persecution, the difficulties, to some amazingly wonderful thing that he had experienced. And he's really talking about himself here. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. Kind of a mysterious statement or two that he gives about this man, and we know that he's talking about himself. He had this ecstatic experience. This is the only time he talks about this. He doesn't talk about it to woo people and wow people. Notice what he says in the next verse. On behalf of this man himself, I will boast, but on, on my own behalf, here and now, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. He was not going to use these ecstatic experiences to persuade people. He wanted to focus on Christ, and that's what he did. Though I, if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. These things really happen. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me here and now and or hears from me, which, of course, would be the word of Christ. So to keep me from becoming conceited, he was a human. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, and you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Again, what is grace? It's only the most important, precious gift of God that we could ever receive. Now, we don't know what Paul's thorn was. Now, there's lots of speculation. If you want to get frustrated, go online and look up Google, what was Paul's thorn? You'll hear all kinds of crazy stuff. I, got, I just turned it off. I won't even give you the details. But there's, this, there's ideas like maybe he had bad eyesight, and there's some verses that talked about his eyes and about maybe his speech. He had a speech impediment, or maybe he had a limp, or, or whatever. 
It doesn't matter. It's a good thing we don't know what it is. We make too big of a deal of it. That's how human beings are. We don't need to know what the thorn in the flesh was. It was some malady, some problem, and yet he said it was to help him not to get a big head, to be not independent but dependent on the Lord. We understand that. And to keep Paul on the ground, so to speak. That's what he admitted. And so we don't really care what that thorn in the flesh was, but we do care about God's answer. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so when we pray and we get a no, let's remember that answer that Paul got. We can think of, apply that to ourselves. No, it didn't happen. I guess God's grace is sufficient for me. I can handle that. That's how we can deal with these things. But as I went through this text, I wonder, have you noticed also already, like I started noticing, that there was another time in Scripture where somebody prayed three times for something and God said no? Remember what that was? Wasn't it Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed three times. Father, if it is possible, may this cup pass from me but not my will, but thy will be done. What was he talking about? He was talking about the cross. He knew what was coming. He was already feeling the weight of our sin as he told his disciples as they were going to the garden, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me and pray. And he prayed three times. The same prayer, Father, if it's possible, may this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. And God's answer to that prayer was no. Why? Because he wanted his grace to be sufficient for all of us. Jesus went to the cross. He willingly went. He accepted the answer of the Father. You might say he joyfully went to the cross to carry our sins. He knew what was coming. He knew the joy that was going to be for all and he went through the suffering and the pain for it all. And he did that because he is our Savior who loves us, who gave himself for us, who gives us grace and mercy each and every day. And there's another phrase that I didn't mention that's there too. Besides, my grace is sufficient for you. What does the Lord say to Paul? For my power is made perfect in weakness. Remember that one too. That's certainly true when we think of the cross of Jesus, the weakness of Jesus. He was weak. He was beaten down. He was nailed to the cross. He suffered. He died. He bled. And yet through that weakness of the cross, there's the power of God for salvation to all who would believe in him. My power is made perfect in weakness. This is a message from God, not from people. And so Paul's response to that prayer request and the answer he received my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness then he responds therefore i will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of christ may rest upon me for the sake of christ then i am content with weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities i can deal with all of that for when i am weak then i am strong because christ is there how thankful we are that God inspired these words in 2 Corinthians. When we hear of those false ideas about Christianity, that if you're a Christian, your life's going to be better. Don't worry. You're going to be healthy, happy, wealthy, successful. We've heard it. This destroys all of that thinking. This puts the focus where it should be, not on us and how good we are and how faithful we are to God, but how gracious and loving God is for us to help us in our need. And he has the wisdom to know what we need, and sometimes that means that we have answers to prayer that are no. I'm going to read for you two other witnesses of the power of the cross in Paul's life as he faced difficulties. These are inspiring words. They're found in 2 Corinthians, first in chapter 4, earlier than this one, and also in chapter 6. So I'm going to read them, and you might want to mark them down and review them sometime this week. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, here's what Paul says. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. 
persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. This is God's grace, sufficient for Paul. And also in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, part of verses 8a or b and then 9 and 10, here's what he says. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, of course, by the Lord, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet make, making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Yes, God's grace is sufficient. And my title of the sermon was a question, wasn't it? Is God's grace sufficient for you? And with God's help, we can answer, yes, indeed, more than sufficient. Praise be to Christ. In his name, amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now worship our Lord with our offerings, and we continue with the offering hymn. This morning in our prayers, as we look at the list in the bulletin, there's some adjustments to be made, so or in some information to share. Uh, Marilyn Heineman had uh, contacted us and told us that her eyesight is coming back, and so she 
uh, is uh, sharing that good news with us and thank, uh, for Thanksgiving to God. And also uh, under the uh, a line down, Dan Schaub is not Chris and June Kazarian's grandson, but a friend. And he has um, uh, ALS. He does live in Billings, and uh, he's suffering from ALS. We also uh, see a line or two down that uh, Ted and Irene Kinsel. Irene, we prayed for the family here a week ago or so. She's passed away, so we're going to adjust our bulletin on that. And uh, we also include in our prayers, they're not, it's not mentioned, it's Phyllis Myers, as we've been praying for her too, that uh, she has a heart condition the doctors are working with, but she still is in need of some, probably a surgery at some point in the near future. We received a prayer request this morning from Dennis Bauer. His neighbor, George uh, Gro Grossi, uh, had um, a, a, a detached retina, had surgery for it, and now is in the process now of uh, waiting for the healing to happen. And we pray that God would bless George and give him patience uh, and comfort during this difficult time. So please stand for prayer. Gracious Father, we praise you for your abundant grace to us in Christ our Lord. Help us to always trust that you are for us and that your responses to our prayers are always for our good. Help us deal with our concerns and problems in true faith, knowing that you will see us through and bring us growth and maturity that honors you and serves our neighbor. Help us to depend on the truth that your grace is sufficient and that your power is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, provider of all good things, we, as we celebrate our nation's independence today, keep us mindful of your blessings that we have received over the years. For our freedoms and opportunities, we praise you. Help us, O Lord, that the freedoms we have enjoyed would be preserved and be a benefit to all our citizens. Promote justice and unity among us. Protect our country from all enemies that would cause division and dis distrust among us. Guide our leaders to serve faithfully and honestly. Make them mindful of your authority over them and lead them to call upon you for wisdom and understanding to govern well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, bless all who stand in need of your healing and supportive hand. Be with and strengthen the faith of Libby Engel, Sharla Arendt, Lori Bauer, Susan Borman, J.R. Bruin, Katie Cardillo, A.D. Sehos, Walter and Betty Flexig, Kathleen Ford, Brittany Hatzel, Marilyn Heineman, and we thank you for the improvement, Peter Janik, Kari... Kariana Jinguji, Dan Schaub, Keith Johnson, Gloria Kern, Ted Kinzel, Margaret Coburg, Dee and Don Crone, Don Kunkel, Tammy Larson, Gary Lycombe, Jeanette Maxson, Sue McCannell, John Mode, Kinsley Murray, Lance Renstrom, Dick Rudio, Lorraine Shackelford, Grace Swift, Stephen Torgerson, Kristen Walter, Doug Winkler, Kevin Worth, Phyllis Myers, and, and George Grossi. And Lord, those that we name in our hearts before you. Thank you for improvement given in health, for the encouragement and comfort you have blessed many with, and for the strength of faith and hope that you provide through the gospel of Jesus, the great physician of body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, bless the seed of your word that has been sown in Muddy Cluster this past week during their vacation Bible school. Thank you for giving our congregation this opportunity this year to share your good news with the children and their families. Thank you for the volunteers and people that have gone to serve this last week. Continue to bless the work of building the youth lodge in the village and use it for the spread of the gospel for years to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God Almighty, during these hot and dry days, we pray your protection for people, animals, property, and crops. In your mercy, provide the relief of rain in a timely fashion and cooler weather for the welfare of, of, of all. O oh Lord, we are continually reminded by such days as this that we are completely dependent upon your gracious hand. And Lord, when we receive moisture and the lessening of temperature, bless us with the attentiveness to give you all the glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
All these things, Lord, we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus our Savior, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We now turn to our ascending hymn number 965. 